What you're about to see is a real-life story. Taken from the files of the police racket and bunco squads, business protective associations, and similar sources all over the country. It is intended to expose the confidence game. The carefully worked out frauds by which confidence men take more money each year from the American public than all the bank robbers and thugs with their violence. I call this case the knockout. And in it, I'm going to take you behind the scenes and show you how carefully a confidence mob prepares and carries out its plans to separate a well-to-do victim from his money. Like other classic confidence games, this one was in effect a play, written, rehearsed, and staged expressly for the sucker, with starring roles for two men. First, meet Harvey Brewster, in confidence lingo, the roper, and this is Clayton Carswell called the inside man. Both must be competent actors able to play their parts with such conviction that not the slightest hint of suspicion is ever raised in their victim, called the mark. But the roper is the boy with the big job on his hands, for he arranges to meet the mark and gain the confidence and trust that will lead the lamb blindly to slaughter. First, the right clothes, to fit the particular part the roper is to play. In this case, the secretary to the president of a steamship line. But clothes don't make the crook any more than they do an honest man. The roper must work in strict accordance with a rigid code of rules evolved from the experience of confidence men through the years. I don't have to tell you what to do, Harvey. You've got a good grip sense. But on this job, there are some things I don't want you to do. Remember them, or you'll ruin the whole thing. Shoot. Sit down. First. Once you've latched onto this mark, don't let yourself get bored with him, no matter what kind of a square he turns out to be. Just remember that you're playing him for the 50 grand touch. That'll keep you interested. For 50 grand, I'd be bosom pal of King Tut's mummy. All right. Now, be a good listener. Don't ever stop him when he's talking. Don't contradict him. If he lies and brags about himself, that's fine. He's warming up to you. You get it? Oh, I'm fascinated with everything he says. All right. And never talk politics. Nothing can break a beautiful friendship like talking politics. Switch them to women. Yeah, if you see he has an eye for him. And there's one thing more. Don't forget to stick with him. You let him out of your sight. You run the chance that he'll mention the proposition you're letting him in for to somebody who might queer the deal. Is that clear? Clear. Tell me, who am I playing for? Terry Turner. Terry Turner, the band leader? <laughs> That's our boy. <laughs> Brewster had a week to get ready for Terry Turner. He hired a dance musician to teach him all about the band business, to give him at least a nodding acquaintance with its instruments, to coach him in the dance man's jargon. A tedious job, but the smart roper knows that a common interest is the most fertile ground in which to grow the bond of confidence, friendship, and trust. Now look, let's get going on some of the big names in the business. You know, the old timers like Big Spiderbeck and that crowd. Oh, old timers. Well, you had Miff Mole on trombone, uh, Don Murray on tenor, and uh, Frankie Trombar, Whiteman's old hot man. Now, the thing to remember about him is that he used a C melody. C melody, get it? The only one, as far as I can remember. <laughs> then you had Adrian Rolini. Ah, oh, he played bass sax and hot chimes, you know. Libby boom 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 great. Swell, Mellow Rooney. <laughs> then you had Joe Venuti on hot fiddle. Well, how's it going? Great, man. This cat really gets on. Nah. Look, why don't you do this? Tomorrow, bring me in the whole business on a sheet of paper. You know, names, instruments they played, bands they played with. You know what I mean. Okay, Pops. Have it for you first thing in the morning. I got the dope on Turner. He starts the layoff after work Saturday. Heads for a vacation Sunday. Driving? Train. <laughs> I sure would like to have him in my outfit. Love the way he plays those chimes, oh, huh? Brother, he's smooth. Uh, who are you with, Harvey? Oh, it's been about 10 years, I guess. I used to play a slip on in a range for a little outfit out of Princeton. You know, proms, club dates, that kind of stuff. Sure wish I could have stayed with it. But my old man set me up with a big shot friend of his, president of a steamship line, Clayton Carswell. Well, I finally got to be Carswell's secretary. Not for long, though, not with that old. Yeah, I know what you mean. That's why I like fronting a band. No boss but Terry Turner. Oh, he's no slave driver. 
It's just that I found out the old goat's pulling something I just can't stomach. No, sir, I'm quitting next Tuesday night after the next fight. Tuesday night? You got a schedule? No, no. <laughs> no, this is boxing. Oh. President of a steamship line? Well, he fancies himself quite a sportsman. He should be through here any minute now. You know, he's got the private car right next door. Oh, it'll tip me off. Yeah, sure. I don't know why I bore you with all this. Bore me? I get it all the time from my boys. I encourage it. Graph department, I call it. Well, he got himself a fighter. Kid name of Johnny Dendero. Nice kid, 25 or 26. He's got a great build, but nothing else. He couldn't punch his way out of a butterfly net. And Coswell's letting this kid get his brains bashed out, telling him he's great. Well, maybe he knows. Yeah, he knows all right. He's making a second fortune over the kid. How does he figure to make a fortune out of a horizontal Henry? You leave it to Coswell. You see, he bets heavy, in somebody else's name, of course, that the kid will get knocked out in a certain round. That way, he gets long odds. Then he fixes it with the kid to take a dive in that round. Happens every fight. Oh, no. And for this, he gives this kid 75 bucks a week. How's that for a sportsman? And he's a nice kid, too. Six months, he'll wind up drooling and selling pencils out of a wheelchair. Hey, uh, this fight, Tuesday night, is that fixed? Oh, sure. I don't know what round yet, but I'll find out from the kid. And if that fight goes that way, I'm going to go straight to the boxing commission. I'm going to put a stop to that. Yeah, sure. You know, I'd like to see that fight. You want to see the kid get his head knocked off? Oh, no. I got nothing to do. I thought we might go to the fight and then go someplace else and have a couple of laughs. Okay. But first, tomorrow afternoon, I'll take you over to the gym where the kid works out. You see him and then decide for yourself whether you want to see the fight. Good deal. I'm glad I met you, Harvey. Let's get these freshened up. And he really was glad. Good job so far, Mr. Brewster. The seed of easy money through fixed fights dropped on fertile ground to be nurtured to full flower in the days to come. This looks like a gym. It has all the things a gym is supposed to have. Equipment, fighters, handlers, and spectators. It even smells like a gym. And these men look like they're working out conscientiously in preparation for Johnny Dondero's next fight. With Johnny living up to Brewster's description of him. A kid Clayton Carswell was leading to punch drunk oblivion for his own selfish, inhuman purposes. Yes, it looks like a gym. The training place for fighters, whether Palooka or coming champ. But it's all as phony as a con man's word. A show put on strictly for the benefit of a coming chump. Hey, that's Carswell now. So that's him. Having the kid take a dive in the fifth, huh? Nice work, champ. Just keep that left up a little more. Sure thing, Miss Coswell. I'll go get yourself a shower. Right, see you later. Come on, I'll introduce you. Well, Mr. Coswell, I'd like you to meet a friend of mine, Terry Turner. You know, the orchestra leader. I'm afraid I don't. All the arrangements made for tomorrow night? Yes, sir. I'll take care of the weighing. You won't have to be there. Yes, sir. See what I mean? Real nice guy. Yeah, a real doll. Hey, Harvey, something's been bothering me. Yeah. Sure hope Coswell doesn't find out I'm onto his little gag. No, no, I mean, Coswell tells this kid that he's real champ material, and the kid believes it. Yet he loses every fight the, uh, the way you said. Huh. Is he slug naughty already? Why should the kid... Why should the kid? I'll tell you why. Because Coswell's got the Indian sign on the poor poop. He keeps telling them that's the smart way to do oh, it. No, that doesn't figure. Oh, it doesn't Harvey. figure, huh? Look, these fights, they're all practice fights, right? Yeah. And the kid's supposed to be real good, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, here's the pitch. Keep the kid's real power under wraps. You know, keep fighting them at smokers and keep it out of the papers. Then, one of these days, Coswell keeps telling him he's going to use his influence to get him a real fight, a big one with the challenger. This time, the kid really opens up. He wins by a knockout. Big splash in all the newspapers. New light heavyweight sensation. You see, the kid figures he's going to get a million bucks worth of publicity and a quick shot at the champ. But the old boy never lets him near the challenge. Right. Now, you still want to see the fight? Yeah, sure. But you know what? I'm going to get me a little bet down. Oh, now, don't give me the hearts and flowers, Harvey. This is money in the bank, pal. All right, tell me. How's it going to hurt that kid if I get a little bet down? 
Well, it can't hurt him, I guess. Ah, this is for laughs, kid. Hey, that reminds me. What's with the babe department? Now, that's all fixed up. A girl I met last time I was here, and she's bringing a friend. Yeah? Well, I hope that friend is no little E-flat dame. I like him tall, tender, and slender. Now, how did I know that, Terry? You know, I must read your mind. <laughs> Terry Turner's bet was down. Not with the local bookie, of course. He'd have told Turner there was no such fight. Harvey Brewster placed the bet for him with, uh, someone who could be trusted to keep his mouth shut. Well, at least we could listen to it on the radio. Oh, this is a lot of nonsense, Harvey. Acting like the kid was your brother or something. A fight's a fight. All right, I'll go take a walk. You can listen to it. No, stick around. Well, what about the dames we were supposed to take? What'd you do about them? Well, I told them to come up in about half an hour. Well, at least that's something to look forward to. I got a little bet down on the fight. It's on the air. And I can't listen to it. <laughs> okay, if you feel that bad about it. There you are. Thanks, Harvey. It's only for five rounds. I hope. Well, here we go for round two, fans. It's been a pretty even fight so far, this ten-round battle between Johnny Dundero and Dave Monahan. Neither boy has struck a blow yet this round, but there goes Monahan with a terrific left and a right, and another left to Johnny Dundero's jaw. And that crowd loves it. Johnny tries to come back, but misses. He's got power in those punches, that kid, but wow, Monahan lands another hard right on Johnny's jaw, and Johnny falls into a clinch. As I was saying, this Johnny Dundero's got a powerful punch, but he's wild. There he goes with another one, wide of its mark, and he catches two strong blows to the body from Dave Monahan. Three more to the head and body from Monahan. Dundero covers up and goes into a clinch. Referee tears the boys apart, and uh-oh, Monahan again with a right and a left through the head of Johnny Dundero. Another hard right and a left by Monahan, but Dundero stays on his feet. Johnny's not much of a fighter, ladies and gentlemen, but I'll say this for him, he sure can take it. Another left by Monahan as the bell ends round two in this fight coming to you from the Veterans Memorial Stadium. Direct from Veterans Memorial Stadium. <laughs> That's somewhat of an exaggeration, Mr. Fight announcer. To be absolutely truthful, you should have said, coming to you from the next room, recorded with sound effects and crowd noises, especially for this occasion. And there's the bell for round number five, ladies and gentlemen. The boys stand in the center of the ring trading punches. Monahan getting the better of the exchange, as usual. If I may venture an opinion here, fans, I'd say that Monahan has given up hope of knocking out Don Darrow in this fight, even though there are five more rounds to go. But you can't say Monahan stopped trying. No, sir. Wait, wait. Dondero's down. The punch came so fast I hardly saw it. But Monahan caught Johnny off guard. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, and Monahan's the winner. How do you like that? Round number five. Boy, oh boy, can you call him. You know what I'll take at? I'd rather not talk about it, Terry. Fifteen to one. Hey. How often does this kid fight? You should excuse the expression. Oh, I don't know. Once, twice a week. It depends. Why? Why? <laughs> Maybe you're right. What's the difference? He could fight once a month and we'd still make a fortune. Now, all you have to now, do wait is a find minute, out Barry. what... I told you before I was quitting Coswell after this fight, and I did it. I'm through with him. You quit? Are you crazy? I'd be crazy to stay with him. No, no. Listen, Harvey. When you talked to Carswell, it, it wasn't final, was it? I mean, you can still go back to him. Ah, Terry, I said I'm through. Yeah, but what did Carswell say exactly? Well, he didn't know just why I was quitting, so he just said, uh, if it's more money you want, come and see me tomorrow. Harvey, boy, we're back in business. Shake the hand that shook the hand. Hey, the girls? Now, look, no word about this while they're around. Who wants to talk about business? This is strictly for laughs, and they're all on me. Okay. Come on in, girls. Hello, Hello Becky, Millicent, how are you? Girls, this is Terry Turner. Terry, this is Millicent. Slender, tender, and tall. How are you? Hello, Vicky. How do you Hello. do? Vicky. Well, where do we go? Mm, any place you say. You're paying for it. You decide. Well, I know a good place for dinner. Let's start there. Oh, come on. Mm. Let's go. No E-flat dame for you, Mr. Turner. Slender, tender, and uh, tall. It was a fine evening, bright and gay. Mr. Turner remembered not to talk business. But that's not exactly what did it. The girls knew all the time what was going on and knowing they enjoyed themselves thoroughly watching the bells tinkle on Mr. Turner's fool's cap. And Mr. Turner, seeing the girls have a good time, enjoyed himself all the more. And Mr. Brewster was happy because Mr. Turner was happy. 
It all went round and round in a dizzy circle. Much too brilliant for Mr. Turner to see anything in its real life. But at four in the morning, he couldn't sleep. Girls were girls, and fun was fun. But the rare chance to make a fortune fast and without blowing your brains out through a trumpet night after night, that was something different. Harvey. Hey, Harvey. Hmm? You're going back with Carswell, aren't you? Oh, for crying out loud. Terry, it's 4 o'clock. Look, do we have to talk about it now? Come on, turn off the light, will you? Honest, Harvey, I don't see for the life of me how you can pass up a good thing like this. All right, so you shut your eyes a little to the ethics. Get with it, man. Look, Terry, I've got to get some sleep. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll stay with him for one more fight, all right? Not going to go back to sleep? Okay. And I'll get one big bet down. All the money I can raise. You think you can find me a taker? Well, I'd have to spread it around. How much? 50,000. Oh, no, Terry. I was going to build my folks a home for 50 grand. I'll get my hands on that dough. Brother, they'll have a home for 150 grand. I'll hop up to Chicago, get the money, and be back as soon as I can. Only we're not going to listen to this fight on the radio. This is one fight we're going to see. Love that Harvey Brewster. Four twelve, please. Yeah, yeah, I know what time it is. Will you listen? The sucker just went back home to get 50 grand. Yeah, that's right. But look, he doesn't want to listen to this one on the radio. He wants to see it. Now, can you set him up for the whole treatment? Oh, that's great. Fine. Okay, sweetheart, sleep fast. You couldn't blame Terry Turner for thinking it was the real thing. The place was packed with anybody Clayton Carswell and Brewster and their confederates could pick up. Want to see a free fight, mister? That's all it took to fill the house. Yes, quite a show for a complete phony, but worth it. The hot lights were shining on $50,000 worth of loot. Terry Turner watched this fight differently than he had ever watched a fight before. No yelling for his boy to win. It was in the bag. Johnny Dondero was taking his dive, this time in the eighth. Terry, the kid can take it, you know that. He better. That's all I got to say. He better.
What happened? I don't know, Terry. Something must have gone wrong. Are you sure you didn't make a mistake? Telling me it was the eighth? No, I swear. Look, I told you something went wrong. There's a doctor. This man is in a very serious condition. Better send for an ambulance right away. Where's Cosmo? I'll kill him. Now, wait a minute, Terry. It's not his fault. He lost money on the fight, too. Not what I lost. Every cent I'd saved, the house I was going to build. I know, Terry. It's tough. But what's the point in saying cars will about it? What's the point? If it hadn't been for him and his dirty tricks, I'd never been mixed up in this. I'm worth the boxing commission. Now, wait a minute, Terry. You go to the boxing commission, you're going to get me in a jam, too. Now, look, let's do it this way. You go on up to the hotel room. I'll bring Carswell over and, well, he's a pretty smart cookie. Maybe he'll think of something. Now, come on. This is an outrage. The idea of you telling me that I'd be mixed up in a crooked fight. Some fine example of a sportsman I'd be doing a thing like that. And you, how could you think up such a lie? Telling this man a fantastic story that could only come from a sick mind. You're through, Brewster. And that won't be the end of it. Wait a minute, you. If you think I'm falling for a phony line like that, you're crazy. I'm going to the boxing commission the first thing in the morning. I'm looking for a Mr. Carswell, or... His... I'm Carswell. What is it? I'm Dr. Venable, Mr. Oh, Carswell. Oh, yes. I... You examined my boy. Come in. I just wanted to tell you I rode with him in the ambulance. He died on his way to the hospital. He's... Dead. I'm very sorry. The boy, dead. Well, what'd you expect? If he'd lived, he'd have been a helpless cripple the way you've been handling him. I never realized it. I never realized it. Oh, I shouldn't have done it. It's a little late to think of that. Well, the boy's dead. You made a lot of money out of him. Go on out and spend it. Have yourself some fun. You're paying me back the money I lost. Every cent. You hear? All right, you'll get it. Come on, Terry, let's go out and get some fresh air. I'll go to the boxing commission with you in the morning. Wait. I'll go to jail. We'll all go to jail. We've got to think. A man's been killed. Killed? That's right. That's manslaughter. Yeah, I'm getting out of here. You can do what you want. I had no part of this. Well, there it is. Fifty thousand. <laughs> you were great, Harvey. Perfect. Now, say something nice about my performance, huh? Well, you were a little corny when the doctor got here, but you'll improve, Clayton. You'll improve. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was it. It worked without a hitch. Of course, Johnny Dondera wasn't dead, but the job was so well done that it left Terry Turner too scared to show his face on a bandstand for months. But he did finally go to the boxing commission to get it off his chest, and the commissioner phoned me. Turner swallowed his pride and gave us the evidence that we needed to send the whole mob to jail. As long as there are two people, confidence games will go on and on. Well, I hope I've been able to give you some idea of how the con man operates in actual cases. The fact is you'll find con men almost any place from the scrubbiest parts of town all the way up to the playgrounds of the social set. And in each case, they manage to fit right into the background they're working against. And when you tell a sucker that he's been swindled, most of the time he won't even believe it. But finally, when the truth does sink in, he says, but how was I to know he didn't look like a con man? Well, they never do, or they wouldn't be in the business very long. Now, can you tell a con man when you see one? Is there any way? No, because he looks just like anybody else. The con man uses only what nature gave him, his brain, charm, an ingratiating manner, and an understanding of human nature that would do justice to a professor of psychology, believe me. Let's face the facts. No one's going to give you something for nothing. Investigate before you invest. Don't be a sucker for these criminals who are so confident they can fool anyone, even you. See the squad next week, same time, 
same station.